God has it always been this way? Well, even from the beginning, men hated Jesus. Even though he did nothing but love them and teach them and heal them, they nailed him to a cross. They thought they had killed him, but they only set him free to live in the hearts of people like you and me who believe in him. Then came the apostles, and most of them were killed for telling other people about Jesus. But by that time, it was too late. There were hundreds of people who believed in Jesus. So they tortured them and killed them, and they even left their bodies to rot as an example to other people. But the church kept right on growing, watered by the blood of these precious saints. But Dad, did they want to die? No. They didn't want to die. I mean, many of them had children just like you that they had to leave behind. But they were forced to make a choice. I mean, they could choose to live this one life here on earth and reject Jesus and be damned. Or they could choose to believe in the words of Jesus and live forever. I think I understand. Here, maybe this will help you understand. I have heard how Christians long ago were brought before a tyrant's throne. And they were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name. The great angelic wise I can almost hear their voices ring. Now our time has come to count the cost, to reject this world, to embrace the cross, and one by one let us live our lives for the one who died, to give us life to the trumpet. On the final day, let us proudly stand and boldly say, I pledge allegiance to the land with all. got to remember that it wasn't always this way. I mean, my dad could even pray in school. And of course, they took that away from him. And then it became incorrect 
for us to believe in the Bible. And after that, they just stripped our right to worship away from us, and we, we quietly stood by. But son, I hope that you're never put in a position that you have to choose between your faith and your life. But if you are, I know which choice you're going to make. Because I know that Jesus lives inside of you. In the meantime, just pray like I taught you how to. And take care of your mom. And remember that God is the Father of the fatherless. You've had your chance, Christian. Now you can rot in this cell with this other fellow here. Why? He's been here over 30 years. <laughs> and Jesus hasn't been here to let him out yet. And remember, no trouble. If I hear one word of prayer out of you, it'll be your son we'll be talking to. Please, leave the boy alone. He's done nothing. <laughs> well, you know, we don't have any lions or a coliseum here. But unless you renounce this Christ of yours, you'll find that our guillotine works very well indeed. You have 24 hours. On your feet, soldier. Yes, sir. I know the old timer in there thinks he's your friend. Prove him wrong. Oh, and uh, don't be tempted by all this talk of theirs about a perfect world in heaven. From what I can see, there's lots of room in there for one more on the other side of those bars. Don't worry, sir. We've got a new world now, and we're not going to let a few losers stuck in the Stone Age hold us back. Our hope is not in this world. Shut your mouth! My name's Jack. Jack Trelford. What do you know? They brought me another Christian to share my cell. I guess they never read Matthew 18, 20. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there in the midst am I. What do you think of that? Hey, Dylan, you know that mean old boss of yours? He just started a real genuine prison church. Get down in there, John. Don't make me have to do something that neither of us wants. Relax, old buddy. We're not hurting anybody in here. What can two helpless guys do locked in a cell? 
you doing? Don't worry. The only sun is where we really want to go anyway. Death is a welcome reprieve to this dirty hole. You don't understand. I'm not worried about me. They've got my son. You got your son? What do they got him for? What are you in here for? For being a Christian. No, no, no. Why are you in this cell? What are you in jail for? For being a Christian. You mean it's against the law to be a Christian out there? Boy, I've got some catching up to do. That explains why I've been in here so long. I served my sentence years ago. They keep coming up with some nonsense. I'm not ready for society. The truth is, I know the truth about Christ. I've got some catching up to do. Well, the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on to you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand, Ephesians 6.13, It's all about allegiance. And the lines have been clearly drawn. You and I have made the decision on which side of the line we're standing on. But to choose to stand with Christ is now against the law. They're actually blaming our beliefs for all the hatred in the world. I mean, if you didn't understand this spiritual battle, you'd wonder how it all happened so fast. How would you expect this? Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, remember it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world will hate you. Remember the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, Jesus, they'll also persecute you. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, 2, the time will come that whosoever kills you will think he's doing God's service. And that word fundamentalist has actually become a, a, a word of a real condemnation that is used in the mouths of many people, both religious and non-religious. Yet fundamentalism is simply orthodox Christian belief as has been held by Christians for 2,000 years. That which fundamentalists believe about the Bible and w about life, which is based on the Word of God, is identical with what Christians have held for 2,000 years. It is not we that have changed. It is the society that has changed. And the situation is escalating. Countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, and the Sudan openly persecute Christians while the rest of the world turns its head. Even Canada and the United States aid such atrocities, not only by their silence, but also with their own increasing intolerance. And in Europe, the future heart of the Antichrist's empire, the situation is no better. Using Waco as a springboard, the Council of Europe has approved a directory of religious cults. In France, a similar listing includes such so-called cults as the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association and the Assemblies of God, two mainline evangelical organizations. They're saying we're going to get rid of cults, but they classify Baptists, classify Pentecostals, classify anyone that's with the Full Gospel Fellowship as cultists. The persecution's coming. Why? Because the New World Order is about to appear as this world dictator arises. The marriage of such anti-Christian sentiments and modern technology is a frightening one. Imagine not being allowed to enter a country because of your beliefs. The idea seems unreal, yet in a speech to cutting-edge electronic identification insiders and immigration officials from all over the world, Jerry Webster, a spokesman for the United States INS Department, spoke of how countries are now sharing information on those deemed to have dangerous beliefs. But identifying marks, especially some kind of tattoos that identifies somebody with being uh, maybe a member of a particular cult or a particular subversive group that's international, we're certainly talking of sharing at least those images. How could so-called subversive groups be tracked? It may come as a surprise, but the technology is already in operation. 
If you go through Terminal 3 at Toronto International Airport, the United States Department of Immigration has a biometric scanner which you can use if you sign up for the program. It's called INSPASS. And in order to sign up for this program, you give the U.S. Department of Immigration a handprint and uh, you pass through this system, put your hand on a reader which reads your handprint after having read the, the information that's encoded on your card. Uh, you punch in your flight number on a uh, little terminal and the gate goes open and you walk through without having to talk to a customs or an immigration officer. I, I certainly feel that someday we will all be identified by our biometric, both for use in an ATM machine, we will walk up and put our uh, finger pattern, our hand geometry, or our, our eye scan in front of that machine and we'll be accepted right into the system and welcomed and, and we'll be able to transact our business. Uh, I believe biometrics will be used in every part of our life someday. I believe it will be used to unlock the door to your house, to start your car, uh, to transmit transactions or get on your computer. Everything you do will require that you prove who you are. The principle of being able to identify people is a reasonable one um, and in many cases we want to be able to identify people. Um, we want to make sure that you're using your credit card, we want to make sure that your health data is being associated with your previous medical record. So that the principle of identifying people is perfectly reasonable. The question is, as with everything else, how are we going to place limits on this so that it's not used in other ways that we don't think are appropriate? Uh, technology is always worn two faces and it is the it is the timeless problem of society to ensure that technology serves humanity and not have humanity serving technology. The latter equation is the Orwellian life. We're getting closer to it all the time. We've got to stop. We see a tremendous uh, pressure to develop technical solutions to certain kinds of problems, whether it is uh, policing or marketing or uh, revenue checking through uh, Revenue Canada. So the pressure on, in both directions comes in a way that encourages technical means of identifying, classifying people, that is to say grading people according to certain criteria, and uh, sorting them within these classification systems and trying to predict their behaviors. Initially the, the uh, I guess, police, uh, security services, and so on that protect our, our countries um, would use these mechanisms to trace down criminals and those who are perhaps taking uh, terrorist type activity and so on. However, uh, who's to stop that from bleeding over to the, uh, to the average citizen and taking advantage of uh, what we classify our own privacy? Uh, it's all too easy to bleed over. For example, you have um, the situation of uh, policing. Increasingly, policing is done in a preemptive way, trying to uh, work out who is likely to break the law, who uh, is going to infringe some rule. And that preemptive, so called techno policing, is, uh, is, is on the rise. It's, it's a good solution from the point of view of cost benefit analysis. Uh, but what does it do? What does it do? It means that time-honoured uh, features of our own legal system, which has a, a good ethical base, that you are innocent until you're proved guilty, is just turned on its head. If you're in a category of suspects just because you happen to uh, your profile happens to fit the statistical likelihood of your being in that category, you are guilty until proved innocent. You see, so often what happens, these things become something like the sorcerer's apprentice. We create the instrument. There's a legitimate reason for it, but the instrument goes on and becomes a monster in its own right. I caused them trouble. I was defending people and getting them acquitted who they wanted in prison. They didn't like that, so they started to look at me, to try and find out about my personal background, who my father was, what our family was, where my money came from, uh, whether I had a single or, or had girlfriends, that kind of thing. Personal information that they had absolutely no business gathering. There are very big forces out there that, while they don't coerce us, certainly are trying to manipulate our choices, channel our desires, make us live in a particular kind of way, and it may not be the way that we would choose to live if the various kinds of uh, alternatives were explained to us. Today, as we move into this brave new world, which has that same synchronistic, uh, pluralistic religious view of the ancient Romans, 
Christianity seems more and more out of step. Those who hate Christianity find they're able now in this brave new world that we're entering to attack Christianity, claiming that somehow our beliefs make us intolerant. Jesus said in John 15, 25, they hated me without a cause. But during the tribulation hour under the new world order and the world dictator, it's going to get worse. Anyone who even honors this Christ is going to be killed, Revelation 13, 15, Revelation 20, verse 4. I bet when they come up with all this new technology, they didn't tell anybody to be used for this. They sure didn't. In fact, it sounded so good that even a lot of Christians thought it sounded great. I remember a few years ago they came in, they took our fingerprints, scanned my face, all that technical stuff, but I thought it was just for prisoners. I'm afraid not, John. It's for everybody now. They're keeping track of everyone. They sure must have a big filing cabinet out there somewhere. Times have changed, my friend. Times have changed. There are enormous quantities of highly sensitive and intimate personal information about all of us now contained in data banks all over the place. Governments alone have literally billions of pieces of information. If they start matching up all this data and using it any way they like, our rights and our privacy are in serious jeopardy. That is now happening and needs to be looked at very carefully. 30 years ago, people were screaming and yelling about a national database, a national data bank, and that there were proposals to create a single computer filled with personal information on all people in this country. Well, now that's a ridiculous concept. You can have distributed networks, distributed systems. You can have millions and millions and millions of computers. They all talk to each other. You can link information. You can share information. You can manipulate it. You can create profiles. You don't, it, it, it's absurd to talk about a data bank. The information is all over the world. It is in many, many different databases, and they can all talk to each other. I don't think we'll ever see one mega computer storing all the information on everyone everywhere. It will be network that will allow access to information across the board, but there'll be many multiple computer systems and network systems all operating independently and yet can cross border, can talk to each other to bring up files and, and uh, communicate across the world. If that's the case, then everything you say, do, can be tracked and monitored, literally. And as the capability of store that information becomes more and more cheaper and able to be done, then uh, everything you do and say can be tracked. It's the ease with which um, information can be moved, databases can be merged, um, and the ease and the difficulty in controlling who has access to that information um, that raises very serious concerns. Um, and they're very legitimate concerns. There's so much money at stake and there's so much potential to make, to, to profit from, from the system that um, I think we're fooling ourselves if, if we think that they haven't put a lot of careful thought into exactly how the system's designed. So I think um, when, when anonymity isn't a feature of the system, that's not an accident. That's a design goal. We create a lot of these, a lot of these uh, encroachments on privacy uh, in order to, because they're administratively convenient, they save money, they help us plan, they help society with a, any one of a number of perfectly legitimate activities. But in the course of doing it, we create tremendous potential to invade people's privacy. With uh, the press of a button, these uh, computers these days can turn out information, coordinate reams and reams of information on people. Where they go, what they do, who, uh, where they've been holidaying, with whom, and all of that. You know, I mean, if people want to be uh, stamped and identified and dehumanized or traced and matched uh, in this fashion, then what kind of society do we have? Um, it's much like the bomb. Uh, you have it, it gets used. Uh, you set up a concentration camp, it gets filled. So I think the technology, in a sense, um, 
creates the preconditions for its own use. The thing that is really needed here is an aware, alert citizenry. I think if the public understood uh, even a quarter of the informational exchanging that is going on without their knowledge and consent, they would be very, very concerned indeed. Wow, beat me up, Scotty. Sounds more like Star Trek than the evening news. I guess this is all a shock to me, having been in here for so long. The world must have seen it coming, though, right? I'm afraid not. Even though the technology had been around for years, nobody really paid too much attention to it. And computers that watch where you drive and satellites up in space that could track your every move. They've even been able to monitor our phone calls for years, but nobody really paid too much attention to it. Almost no one saw it coming. Almost no one? Yeah, almost. Those of us who did express our concern were just branded as paranoid, as people who hated technology, people who just weren't ready to be part of a new united world. And the problem was that the very technology that we were concerned about was actually used to track us down. And believe me, there's no longer anywhere to hide. It is very hard to hide anything right now because of the high technology. Uh, technology is advancing so rapidly that many times we can't um, cope with it. Many times we don't understand it. We don't know how the systems work. But the technology provides a surveillance that governments want. You might once have imagined that a car park would be watched by a physical attendant with a little peaked cap. Can you imagine a situation where many, many thousands of kilometers away there is somebody in a quite different country, quite different continent, watching the car park where your car happens to be? Now, that's the kind of age that I think we're living in. You know, you got the stars of the harvest moon going for you, you got nature going for you, you're all by yourself, or so you think. And you look up in the sky and you see something moving through the sky. It's a satellite. Now, I'm not saying it's spying on me, but with the infrared techniques and so on. So I wasn't really alone. And I mean, you know, people have to, on either a dramatic personal discovery basis or not, realize, you know, that this will happen. Well, the high-tech equipment has certainly advanced uh, tremendously over the years. Uh, you're right by saying, uh, is it possible to uh, be able to monitor a person's license plate? The technology is certainly there. And uh, we can even downsize a little bit further. Uh, we can probably read the headlines of a newspaper. All a person has to do is uh, watch the movie called uh, Patriot Games. And you can see what type of image imagery they used. Uh, thermal injury imagery they used uh, by identifying an individual. Many times we can use infrared technology. Uh, because uh, this is a heat-seeking uh, uh, type of equipment, that anything that has been hot, such as a car engine, can be picked up. One thing which is on the horizon is something that is called intelligent transportation systems. This is a proposal which is currently being developed and will be in place in the near future that will monitor your movements on the highway. Cars will be equipped with a computer device, tolls, bridges, there will be mechanisms along the highway to track your movements. They will record your license number. They will make sure that your registration is up to date. They will make sure that you are not wanted for any tickets that you might owe. So that all of this will be monitored electronically and they can monitor your activities. Canadians should be aware that CSE has this database and it contains personal information on Canadians and it's held indefinitely. And they should be aware every time they use their phone, be it a cell phone or even what we call landline phones, or a portable a walkabout phone, every time they use their, their ATM for a banking transaction, any time they do anything that is going to be transmitted over the airways, it's there for people to pick up, listen to and do with whatever they want.
Often when we look at new technologies, we think, wow, this is so new, we have no context to deal with these issues. And yet in the 20s, companies uh, had a, a common practice that they would raid their employees' homes to make sure their employees weren't stealing from them. And people said, give me a break. That is an invasion of my personal space. That is outside your appropriate role as a business person. And, and, and the law eventually caught up and said, no, you can't do that. And I think to a large extent, that's what we're seeing now. That just because we can do something, because technology enables us to do all sorts of things, doesn't mean we should. Uh, we are living in a society now in which surveillance in, in, in a score of different forms is becoming a routine of our lives. We cannot get up, leave our homes and go to our work anymore without being stared at, spied upon. Uh, tracked, recorded, monitored, uh, you name it, uh, in, in 30 or 40 different ways almost every day. I mean, there's people who make a living out of invading people's privacy, and some of them are called corporate executives, some of them are called deputy ministers of human resources or what have you, that's their job. So you uh, and I and every all the rest of us are going naked before the world, believe me. Wow, I thought it was bad in here. It seems to me the good old big brother's everywhere now. Yeah, and what the world doesn't know is that all this stuff is paving the way perfectly for the rise of the Antichrist. When you try to tell people about the Bible and its warnings for the world, they either laugh it off or lock you up. Even the number of the beast is no big deal to most people now. I was just reading about that. He calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six. Hundred, three score and six. Six, six, six. They're using that now, today? It's become a bigger part of our everyday lives than most people realize. But once again, you try and tell them about it and they just laugh it off as superstition or they hate you for just bringing it up. I find it extremely interesting that the UPC barcode as designed in 1973 was coincidentally uh, designed around the number 666. Universal product codes, or UPCs, are found on almost every store product today. These codes allow the cashier to scan the item into the computer instead of entering the price manually. Every UPC is made up of numbers and bars. The bars themselves also have a numerical value. Notice that the bars on the left, in the middle, and on the right of the code do not have numerical values underneath them. However, the other bars all do. So by comparing these three bars at the beginning, the middle, and the end with numbered bars, it is clear that those dividing bars always represent the number six. Uh, even though it's, uh, it's not apparent visibly to anyone who looks at it, uh, there is a mathematical representation there of the number 666. The book of Revelation tells us that in the last days, no one will be able to buy or to sell without the number 666, despite the protests of industry insiders who claim that it is all just a coincidence. The fact is that virtually every product sold in the world today is sold with the number 666 built into it. This is incredible. Even your regular newspapers would be all over this, even if they didn't believe in the Bible. This is pretty interesting. That's what you'd think, but it's still been ignored right from the beginning. And those reporters that did talk about it just tended to make fun of it as if Bible prophecy were some sort of old wives' tale. Boy, I never really thought of it, but maybe it's not so bad in here after all. Looks like I wouldn't get much more freedom out there. At least I wouldn't have this darn tracking advice showing everywhere I went.
Oh, don't be so sure about that. The last few years, the technology for implantable microchips has gone through the roof. They just seem to make so much sense that nobody stopped to consider the implications. Farmers are now using radio frequency ID chip implants rather than brands or tattoos. And many insurance companies now are, are, are requiring animal owners to identify their pets with chip implants and, and uh, farm herds must be identified with chip implants or uh, livestock insurance cannot be obtained. So I think it's, uh, it's clearly evident that the uh, technology of preference today is radio frequency ID chip implants. Of course the burning question is, what about implants in people? Barbara Masson, the Director of Operations for Electronic Identification Devices, says there would be no technical problem in implanting the chips in humans. The Washington Times describes the process further. According to promotional literature, it is an ingenious, safe, inexpensive, foolproof and permanent method of identification using radio waves. A tiny microchip the size of a grain of rice is simply placed under the skin. It is so designed as to be injected simultaneously with a vaccination or a loan. And MasterCard's new commercials featuring the voice of Star Trek Jean-Luc Picard is already promoting a mark to a global audience. 374-90042. Account code. 963-400. Key code. Since the last thing you need is one more number to remember, MasterCard is developing the single-digit PIN code. Someday, a computer chip in your card will recognize your unique mark, so your personal identification code is personal. It's how the future will be paid for. MasterCard. It's smart money. The secular news media seems uh, uh, enthralled or extremely enthusiastic about the concept of identifying human beings with chip implants. Recently, we've seen newspaper articles in the Chicago Tribune, the Marin Independent Journal in San Francisco, Popular Science Magazine, the Tucson Citizen newspaper in Arizona, and various other publications that suggest uh, the eventual use of chip implants in people's bodies to replace ID cards, debit cards, and, and various other forms of identification, including passports. Most times, people who invent technology uh, are imbued with the notion that because a, a piece of technology can do something, it is the thing that must be done. That is the wrong question. The question is always got to be, is it the right thing to do? People now who, who, who have implants in them, the traces, their movements, it helps their health means, but it's also an invasion of privacy. Soon there's, there's computers that are apparently being developed that can read your brain waves, that can read your thoughts. I mean, this is not, these aren't toys or, or, or beyond the realm. People have to grapple with whether they want that Big Brother screen, which will be there. It's just phenomenal, uh, the amount of information that's out there in the secular media that would lend us to believe that chimp implants are going to be used to identify us and, uh, and the, the concept of chipping people in their hands is, is what's astounding to me since the Lord says specifically that the mark of the beast will go in the right hand or forehead and no one will buy or sell without it. So I've taken the mark of the beast without even knowing it. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to hell? No, of course not. Relax. The technology itself isn't evil any more than credit cards or that water bottle over there. The decision to follow Satan and take his mark are spiritual decisions. You can't be tricked into it. It's like I said before, it's a matter of allegiance. And those people who decide to take the mark of the beast will do so because they want to. They'll consciously and deliberately turn their backs on God. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And a decision to follow God will save you from all this. It's a decision that every person has to make for themselves. All you have to do is just decide if you believe that Jesus died for your sins. I 
do believe. I want to be saved. I believe that Jesus died for me. Please tell me what to do. You've already done it, my friend. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Where's Dylan? Where's Dylan? This is impossible. Where can they be? You, search the grounds. And bring me his son. Where's his son? I told you to bring me his son. I'm afraid the boy's gone too, sir. I mean, his cell is still locked, but we can't find him anywhere. This is impossible! How can that be? They've got to be somewhere. Find them and kill them. Did you hear me? Find them and kill them all. They've got to be somewhere. Friends, my heart has really been moved as I've been watching this dramatization with you. And I'm sure that you've been reminded that you have been actually reading about this in your newspapers and in your magazines, all about the breakthrough in computering and satellite tracking and bioengineering and communications, global communications, and so many, many other things, the smart cards. Now, we are living in a brave new world. There's a dark side to that. But there's also a wonderful light side to that, and that is the coming of the Lord. And Jack, I'd really like to ask you, how soon do you think the coming of the Lord is in the light of all we've seen? Rexella, Jesus said, when you shall see all these things, not just one, but all of them happening simultaneously, then you know that my coming is near even at the door. Matthew 24, 33. And because it's so near, we have to warn people. Ezekiel 3.17 states, Son of man, I've made you a watchman. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Isaiah 58.1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people, warn my people about their transgressions. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 tells us to warn the unruly or the the careless, and we are to warn all men, Colossians 1.18. Why? Because the time is at hand. Revelation 22.10. Well, you know, one thing that Jack has warned us about so very, very often is the new world order. Now listen to this, friends. I found this so interesting. In 1960, there were virtually no courses being taught along the lines of a new world order in our universities. Today, there are between 500 and 1,000 colleges and universities teaching the new international order, all sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. All this planning does not come from the lips of impotent, powerless utopians. Instead, the perpetrators of the world order are moving ahead by planning a new economic plan. Sponsored by Rockefeller. Yes. That's important. Listen to this. I'm going to quote him right now. Rockefeller stated that there is too little time left to get the plan accomplished gradually because the fundamentalists are waking up. And then, of course, he's talking about all the evangelical Christians there. I'm also going to quote from Richard A. Falk of the World Federation Association, and this is what he had to say. It's evident that the New World Order, as conceived in Washington, is about control and surveillance. 
A leading member of the Council on Foreign Relations, James P. Warburg, told the United States Senate's Foreign Relations Committee on February 7th, way back in 1950, we shall have world government, whether we like it or not, by consent or by conquest. Oh. Friends, that is powerful. Oh. Jack, will it be by consent or by conquest? I'll get into that in a moment, but first of all, let me give a little background material here. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 49, Nebuchadnezzar the king has a dream, and the prophet Daniel interprets it for him under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Daniel describes five world empires and the final one of history being represented by ten toes, Daniel 2.41. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 4 to 8, the prophet himself has a vision of the future and sees these same empires depicted by these beasts. And the final government is a composite beast with ten horns. Now, the ten horns are mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7, 20, and 24. But I don't know what ten horns means. Well, the Bible interprets the Bible. Daniel 7, 24. The ten horns are ten kings that shall arise. When? For the end time. Now, who are the ten? It started in 1948 with Benelux, when Belgium, the Netherlands, which is Holland, and Luxembourg began the movement. And then, of course, in 1957, we had Germany, and Italy and France join it for a total of six, ratified by the Treaty of Rome, for this is the revived Roman Empire. Then, of course, in 1973, England, Ireland, Denmark came on board for a total of nine. And then on January the 1st, 1981, Greece became a member for a total of ten toes, Daniel 241. Ten horns, Daniel 7-7. Seven, seven. And this would be the organization, the final world government that would create this system of keeping track of every person through technology, a numbering system, which I believe is here, as you've seen already on this dramatization. But will it be by consent or conquest, according to what Warburg asked or stated? There'll be some who love the idea and will consent to it, for they will have one mind on this matter. Revelation 17, 13. Others will reject it and die for their stand. Revelation 13, 15. And Revelation 20, verse 4 says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and because they would not, would not receive the mark. Some by consent, some by conquest. Many will refuse it. Well, you know, friends, I have a very good question. Are you already a number instead of a person? This is out of Newsweek magazine by Jane Brian Quinn. They've got your number. You may have squawked that the world is treating you more like a number than a person, and you don't know the half of it. You are a number. Both you and I are branded by our credit score. Uh, David Nuthmode uh, had this to say about it. If you are truly surprised that our privacy could be threatened by a website on the Internet, then you definitely do not understand what we are getting ourselves into. We do not understand that every move we make is potentially traceable. And then listen to this, friends. Uh, Motorola plans a 12.9 billion satellite network. Why? because they want to provide telecommunications services anywhere in the world. Well, Big Brother Goes High Tech by David Banisar, and this is what he has to say. Presently, information on almost every person in the developed world is computerized in several hundred databases. Why? They're collected, analyzed, and disseminated by governments and corporations. Friends, according to what I just read, wouldn't you say that we've lost our privacy? Mm. 
You know, the Bible is right up to date. And do you know that many of the 20th century expressions come right from this book? For instance, did you ever hear anyone say, a little birdie told me? Well, that's Ecclesiastes 10, 20. A bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which has wings shall tell the matter. Oh, for the good days, we're going to be crying out very, very soon when they have information on everyone. And it's coming. Now, in Revelation 17.10, we discussed this a moment ago in the book of Daniel, the Old Testament, but now we want to see what the New Agreement Testament has to say about it. We find that there are only going to be seven world governments. Listen carefully now to Revelation 17.10. There are seven kings... Five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. Who were the five fallen at the time when John wrote the book of Revelation 2,000 years ago? Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Which nation was in existence when he wrote the book? Rome. Which is the one that was yet to come? Revived Rome. Now, in Revelation 13, 1, we see the rise of this international global dictator. And he comes out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. The sea there is the Mediterranean and the European Union nations surround it. And he rises out of that conglomeration of nations. And the Bible says that he has seven heads. Why? Because each one of these seven world empires is mixed together, but this is the seventh and final one. And it becomes global in scope. It started with ten, as we saw, and then moves to a world monstrosity, for Daniel 7.23 says that this world dictator engulfs the entire globe. And then in Revelation 13, after we see this rise in verse 1, verse 3 says, Oh, the world marveled after him. Verse 7, Power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nations. Verse 8, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. The born-again believers won't accept it, and of course they'll die for it in Revelation 20, verse 4. So, he creates this numerical system through all this modern technology to keep track of people. And so in that same chapter, 13, verses 16 to 18, it says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. 600 we know, a score is 20, three score is 60, and six. So there is that infamous number, 666, six, six, the mark of the beast. Mm. Well, Peter Cochran, head of research and development at the British Telecom, says this, I could actually have a passive transponder put under my skin right now. It's no longer a dream, friends. This is reality. It could cost less than a dollar, and it would be there for life. And you know what? It would replace as many as 35 plastic cards in my wallet. Now, most people are going to want this. You know, it's a, a really pesty to have all those cards in your pocketbook or in your wallet. Why not just in the hand? Kane, vice president of Cubic Corporation's Automatic uh, Revenue Collection Services, and they are the ones who make the smart uh, cards systems. He had this to say, if we had our way, we'd implant a chip behind everyone's ear in the maternity ward. Mothers, how would you like to take your baby home from the maternity ward with a chip? implanted behind his or her ear. The computer chip is becoming embedded into popular culture. This is from USA Today. And in the Chicago Tribune, they reported last year, Edward Cornish, president of the World Future Society, predicted that marketing of such chips will begin very, very soon. And as I said, friends, this is not a dream. This is reality, Jack. It's taking place. Oh, Rexella, I've got something here 
that sends chills up and down my spine. It's Strong's Concordance, and it was produced by Dr. James Strong, who was the theological professor at Drew University in the 1800s. It's 150 years old. And it took him 35 years to put this together because he took every word in the Bible, including the word if. And everywhere the word if appeared, he put it in there chronologically from Genesis to Revelation as to where the word is found. And that is every single word in the Bible. Now, when he comes to Revelation 13, 16, the word Mark on page 661, he identifies the Greek meaning of the word in the back of the concordance. And so at point 5480, 5480 and 5481, he has the words uh, karagma and character. And they mean together the use of an engraving instrument to put an incision in the flesh for a mark. But then he says that 666 is not only a number, but is also a word. And it's the word chixastigma. Some call it keysastigma. And you can find this in point 5,516 at the back of the book. And that means it's a sign to designate recognition of a person or ownership. So when you put these three texts together, oh, I can't believe it. 150 years in advance of what's happening. They mean the use of an engraving tool to make an incision in the flesh, to place a mark there for the recognition of a person or ownership of that person. Exactly what the Bible said would come. And that terminology, mark of the beast, is not only found in Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17, but it's also in chapter 14, verses 9 and 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. It's here, Excella. Oh, that Dr. Strong saw it 150 years in advance. And we're here to see it happening. No wonder God told us we have to warn the people, Jesus is coming yes. because the mark precedes his return to earth. Yes. Well, you know, friends, I'll never forget the day that Jack came running into the room where I was and he had a newspaper in his hand and he said, guess what they've done now, Rexella? They have just cloned a sheep. Well, in Discover Magazine two years ago, David Friedman reported, there are Frankensteins among us researchers who are actually figuring out how to build living things. They're not building robots. Freeman then asked the question, what if humans become capable of slapping together new forms of life? What will we do with that kind of power? The day we'll have to decide this is creeping inevitably closer. Well, that time has arrived. Philip Elmer DeWitt from Time Science Editor says this, the next technological step may not be far off. The techniques worked for Dolly the sheep they will work for humans, too. Newsweek reported, there's nothing to stop cloning, not even humans. And Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa, the Democrat there, said this, human cloning will take place, and it will take place in my lifetime. Now, friends, this is a good question. In fact, I've even asked myself this question. Why would anyone want to clone a human being? Tembler says the ethical question would be motivation. Why perpetuate? Remember the movie The Boys from Brazil in which Nazis attempted to clone multiple Hitlers? Their goal was to perpetuate evil. It would not be good for society. Dr. Stewart in USA Today added this, maybe someone in the world would give it a go for whatever reason. Oh, Jackie, you know, it, it is going to come, isn't it? For whatever reason, the yeah. mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. Every time the mark of the beast is mentioned, we also find the terminology, the image of the beast. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic. This is only a theory, but I think the potential is there to clone the coming world dictator who gives this mark. 
in Revelation 13, verse 1, we see this world politician arising, but in chapter 13, verse 11, it states, I saw another beast rise up out of the earth. And this is the world religious leader. And he had the two horns of a lamb, but spake as a dragon. The two horns of the lamb identify him with Christianity because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. But it's a defect. Christian, one who is apostatized because he speaks as a dragon, and the dragon is Satan, Revelation 20, verse 2. Now, this world religious leader wants all the world to honor this first beast out of the sea, out of the Mediterranean area, from the European Union. And because of it, verse 12 says he causes all humanity to worship this first beast. And in verse 14, it states that he has them make, watch it, an image of the beast. And that's the terminology for cloning, the image of the person. While one is asleep, they can take a cell and duplicate the person in his exact image without him knowing it. What a day to be alive, and the debate is raging right now as to whether or not they should do it. And you've just heard, Rexella, read reports by leading specialists who say it will happen. Well, there's one time I know it's going to happen, because this image of the beast is found in the same text as the mark of the beast given a few moments ago, but let me repeat them. In Revelation 13, verses 15, 16, 17, chapter 14, verses 9, 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, chapter 20, verse 4, all about the image. And you know, we have a man right now, a great physicist by the name of Stephen Hawking in England, who says, these computer viruses are alive. It's life. Well, put it all together. They're going to be able to do something as they concoct this image of this infamous world dictator we call the Antichrist, because Revelation 13, 15 says he had power to give life, life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak. What a day to be alive. What a day to be alive. In the future, tiny chip may get under your skin. Now, this was a headline in the Chicago Tribune. Staff writer John Van reported this. I think you're going to be quite surprised. A tiny chip implanted inside the human body to send and receive radio messages is likely to be marketed as a consumer item early in the next century, just around the corner. He goes on to say that several technologies already available or under development will enable electronics firms to make implantable ID locators. You're not going to be able to hide anywhere, friends. We've lost uh, that uh, capability of not being found. Bernard Beck, professor at Northwestern University, said people accept that increased communications make life more convenient, but at the same time, there's no hiding place anymore, just what I said. And then Edward Cornish, president of the World Future Society, said this, although the potential problems with locator ID chips are huge, they may be inevitable, inevitable. He said he believes that such chips will be voluntary at first, but things that are voluntary today have a way of becoming compulsory tomorrow. Whoa! And you know, friends, tomorrow you may not have a choice as to whether you want a tiny chip implanted in your body or not. It might be compulsory, Jack. Ah, oh, I can't get over that statement. What's voluntary today could be compulsory tomorrow. Now, I want you to listen carefully, because your never-dying soul is at stake. What happens to those who receive the mark of the beast? Well, Revelation 16, 2 says, A noisome and grievous sore falls upon all those who receive the mark during that tribulation hour found in Revelation chapter 6 to 18. But that's only the physical. What about the soul after death if they've received the mark? Revelation 
14, verses 10 and 11. They were tormented. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and forever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and who received the mark in their right hand or forehead. Oof. What happens to those who refuse the mark? Well, they may suffer in this life. For Revelation 13, 15 says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And Revelation 20, verse 4 says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, decapitated, for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and because they would not receive the mark. But in the next life, Revelation 15, 2, says, I saw those who refused the marks, standing on a sea of glass, and the harpists of heaven are serenading them. It's a picture of tranquility because they stood for the Word of God in Jesus. And when Christ comes back, what a glorious time it will be for them. For in Matthew 35, 31, he breaks through the blue, and the Son of Man shall come in his glory with all his holy angels, and the world is assembled around him, and he divides the sheep from the goat. And to those who refused the mark, he says in verse 34 of that 25th chapter, Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Oh, what a blessing for the next thousand years as they rule and reign with Christ for 10 centuries. Revelation 20, verse 4. Are you ready to withstand what's coming? Do you know the Lord? Do you have the Holy Spirit to give you this kind of strength for the future? Should you be here at that time? I believe many of us will be taken to be with the Lord before it all happens, called the rapture. When he says, come up hither, Revelation 4.1. But millions will be converted during this time, Revelation 7.14. Newly reborn Christians, who along with many of the Jewish brethren, will suffer for rejecting the mark. So let's prepare. Let's get ready. Look at me right now and pray this simple prayer from your heart. God will save you. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into human flesh 1,900 years ago to die for me, shedding that precious blood to wash away my sin. I want you this day as my Savior. I want to be prepared for the future. So come into my heart. Be my Savior. In your holy name, I pray this. Amen and amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with Jack, we'd love to know about it, and it brings great joy to our hearts to know that many of you repeated that prayer so that whatever happens in the future, you are ready. You know that when the Lord comes, you'll be taken and you'll be with Him forever. I want to leave you with this wonderful, wonderful thought. It brings real comfort to me. I trust that it will to you. It's good to know that you can leave an uncertain future in the hands of an all-knowing God.
have come and the years have gone and the cause of Jesus still goes on now our time has come to count the cost to reject this world to embrace the cross and one by To the trumpet sounds on the final day Let us proudly stand and boldly say I pledge allegiance to the land With all my strength, with all I am I will see Oh